Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, special seminar that we have here at the Three Angel Church. It's called American Crisis with Steve Wolberg. And uh, we're just glad that you found your way out this evening. Delighted that you are here. And we hope that this uh, seminar this weekend will be a great blessing to uh, all of you. Now, um, my name is Peter Gedraget. I'm the pastor at this church, the Three Angel Church. And in order to make the weekend go smoother for all of us, I'd like to share a few preliminary details with you uh, before we get going here tonight. Now, um, in the foyer, you've already probably seen uh, a banner that points to restrooms and to water fountains and to childcare. Yes, we do have childcare. Uh, if you go out the door uh, to um, the left, the one that the banner points towards, you go towards, um, you go to the left, and then on the right side, you will see uh, water fountains, you will see restrooms. If you keep going and you round the corner, you will see um, child care, a child care room to your left. So um, keep in mind that the children that we uh, provide child care for uh, are ages three to 10. And so uh, we encourage you to be bringing your children there if you have children at that age, in that age group. Um, our childcare leaders are very trustworthy and we know that uh, your little ones will be safe there and they will have a great time. They will have a great time. So if you didn't bring children today, but your children at home, feel free to bring them back tomorrow and, and they will have a great time. We'll have a meeting each night for the children. Now, this is opening night, but tomorrow there is more to come. And tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock is our next meeting. And that meeting is entitled, Will Freedom Vanish in America? So that's at four o'clock tomorrow. And after tonight's meeting, you're welcome to take with you some flyers that you find out in the foyer and give them to friends, to neighbors, to relatives, and bring them along tomorrow. They will be out at the registration table. Now, we will provide a light supper tomorrow night. Um, not, well, between the two meetings, around 5.30, the meeting starts at 4 o'clock, around 5.30, 5.30 to 6.30, we'll provide a light supper. And then our next meeting is at 7 o'clock. Uh, the 7 o'clock meeting will last maybe an hour and a half, a little longer. We will have a, a Q&A session at the end of that last meeting. And after the Q&A, we will have a sales table out there with Steve's books and uh, some CDs and so forth that uh, uh, we will provide. Now, the last, night, the last meeting tomorrow night, again, is entitled, When No Man Can Buy or Sell. That's the meeting at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And we have two registration tables, and I hope all of you have registered. We encourage you to register for this seminar, and you should have done that on the way in. Now, we have, it didn't, oh, here we go. A registration card. How many of you uh, did not fill this out? I think all of you did, didn't you? Okay. So this registration card, you fill it out only once. You don't have to fill it out again tomorrow from each meeting, but every night we'll have a basket brought forward here and we'll have a, a drawing for a free gift from the registration cards. So um, in fact, if somebody is at the registration table right now, just bring the basket over here, bring it to the front and we will draw a card right now for a free gift. Um, is there anyone who, yes, somebody under the age of 20? Anyone under the age of 20? <laughs> Wishful thinking. All right, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, the one with the glasses. I think Caleb, right? All right, Caleb, we have a book, one of Steve's books that we would like to offer. And I'm gonna have to shake this up a little bit. I'm going to turn them upside down, fix them. There we go. Why don't you pick one here? And tell me, what does it say? What name do you see there? Sherry and Daryl. 
Sherry and Daryl. Is anyone here by the name of, any two here by the name of Sherry <laughs> and Daryl? <laughs> I think I see uh, somebody right there. This is called Approaching Armageddon. This is written by Steve Wilberg, Discovering Hope Beyond Earth's Final Battle. Approaching Armageddon. Cheryl? All right. Thank you, Caleb. I appreciate that. It's time for me to introduce our speaker. Um, Steve Wolberg is the speaker director for Whitehorse Media, and we are just glad to be hosting this seminar this weekend with Steve. He is um, he's the host of Whitehorse Media's Bible Talks with Steve Wolberg. Um, and he has authored over 500 books. He has, he has um, been a guest on over 500, what? 40 books, did I say 500? <laughs> it's a world record. He has been on 500 radio stations, television stations, been interviewed, been a guest, or been um, um, presenting. And currently, he, he lives in Idaho, in Priest River. That's where my brother lives as well. Not in Priest River, but in Idaho. His wife, Kristen, is there with her two children, Seth and Abigail. Now, Kristen sounds very Norwegian to me. I'm from Norway. I don't know if it's European. European, all right. So I recognize that name. Um, now, Mr. Wolberg considers it is highest privilege to be a husband, to be a father, to be a Christian minister. And uh, he has held seminars now like this throughout America, away from home, and you're looking forward to go home, I'm sure, every time you're done, right? Back to family. He has been overseas. His goal is to glorify Jesus Christ, not himself. And uh, I, he's going to be speaking soon, but before he does, I, you know, we have some special music first. And um, after this meeting, you will receive one of his free books. We'll have a free book after every meeting. Uh, the book that you will receive after this meeting is The United States in Bible Prophecy. Oh, thank you. I gave you the wrong. Yeah, okay, that's another night. The Antichrist identified tonight. So, um, yeah. Well, I gave you a little head start, didn't I? But... Um, no, tomorrow, I think, will be the other book. So um, I would like to ask our singers to come up here. Uh, they are accompanied on the piano by uh, Mrs. Royal. Oh, Jacqueline Kobagaya. I, I saw Mrs. Royal over there. Um, Joyce Royal, she's, she's playing sometimes as well. She played initially, so we are, we're thankful that you played for us earlier. Um, the title of the song that they will be singing is He Will Carry You. He will carry you. And they will sing another song at the end. Uh, what's the name of the last song you will sing? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? That will be after Steve has spoken. Thank you. Bye. 
There is no problem too big, God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall, He cannot move it. There is no storm too dark, God cannot calm it. sorrow too deep, he cannot soothe it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know my brother that he sister that he will carry you. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know my brother that he very much. It was very nice. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Well, welcome here, and you should be welcoming me too to Wichita. Uh, it's been about 30 years since I used to live here, so I do have some Wichita roots a long time ago. Uh, I'm 30 years older now. That was in my 30s. Now I'm in my 60s, and uh, where is the pastor? Is he out there somewhere? First time anyone's ever introduced me of written, having written 500 books. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I would lay claim to that if I could, but I can't. But anyway, uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to the church for all the work that's been done, the music and a lot of other things going on behind the scenes. And so I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here. We are in for a big weekend a lot of big topics. If you've noticed from the flyer, these are big. And if you read between the lines, you've probably picked up from the titles that this is a Bible-based seminar. Uh, that's for sure. I'm a believer in this book. Uh, I've got actually a picture that I'll show you in a little while of what I used to look like when I was a teenager. You hardly recognize me. Uh, and though in those days, I did not believe in the Bible. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills and Southern California, I uh, grew up in a, in a secular Jewish home where we never prayed, we never read the Bible, uh, and so I didn't know anything about God at all. And when I was 20 years old, I started reading this book, and my whole life changed. And so now, instead of going out to the uh, discos and the rock and roll concerts on Friday nights, now I meet with people and I hold Bible seminars. So it's been, a, it's been quite a change for me, and I'm very thankful that I'm alive, uh, thankful to be here, thank you to have a chance to share God's word with you. And so uh, just kind of a little preliminary, if you have a Bible with you, I used to tell people to turn, but now I tell people to turn or click, depending upon whether you've got a, your Bible on your phone. I'm just curious, how many of you actually brought a physical book tonight? Let me see your hands. Okay, and how many of you brought your your Bible on your phone, your smartphone. Okay, well, it's about, uh, it's about the same, pretty much the same. I tell you, times have changed, haven't they? Times have certainly changed. And we, the title, you can see this on the screen 
um, America in crisis. I think we all know that our country is going through many, many crises. And as I was listening to the song, I, I kept, couldn't help but think about our debt crisis. You're aware of all this, all the discussions in Washington, D.C. about whether they should increase the legal limit by which the government can borrow more money so it can pay its bills. And I was listening to, as I was listening to the song, I thought to myself, Jesus paid a bigger debt even than the government has. Our government's debt is about $32 trillion, but the debt that Jesus paid on the cross for all of us uh, is the he died for the sins of the world so thank him for that that's for sure and we and we know that there's all kinds of we have moral issues we have economic issues banking issues uh, environmental issues uh, mental health issues there's just so many issues that are bombarding this country and so what we're going to do this weekend this is a three-part series based on the bible uh, it's going to be mostly around Revelation chapter 13. So if you want to open or click to Revelation 13, three parts, and we're going to be dealing with uh, what I consider to be the big issues. The, and there's a lot of issues that are big, but these are the biggest of them all. We're going into prophecy. We're going to talk about the future. We're going to talk about who, according to prophecy, are the major players in world events. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the future. What is on the horizon? Uh, essentially, what we're going to do is when you look at Revelation 13, if you've read that chapter, it is a, to uh, base it on an old, an old book called, if you've heard of the book, The Tale of Two Cities, uh, the book of Revelation chapter 13 is the tale of two beasts. Two beasts. One beast rises up out of the water, and another beast rises up out of the earth. And then both beasts work together to enforce something called the mark of the beast. And that's what we're going to be trying to decode and unpack and explain this weekend. So tonight we're going to deal with the first beast, the beast that comes out of the water. And then tomorrow at four o'clock, we'll focus on the second beast and how that ties in with the United States of America or whether it does tie in. Uh, and then the third meeting, when no man can buy or sell, we're going to talk about the final time when freedom will completely uh, disappear and this mysterious mark will be enforced. And we'll talk about what does that mean? What does the Bible say? Do we see things happening in the world right now that are uh, leading us in that direction? So that is ultimately what we're going to be going through. Three meetings dealing with these big issues in Revelation chapter 13. We're going to read almost every verse right through the chapter. So uh, does that sound like a plan? Make sense? And you'll get little books, little pocket books. Uh, some of the books, some of the 40 or so books that I've written are little books, some are bigger books. And so you'll be getting some of the little books, these what we call pocket books. Uh, tonight will be a book about the first beast. Tomorrow at eleven or uh, at four o'clock will be a book about the second beast, and then the final book will be about the mark of the beast. And those are free, free for you to um, read and check them out. And I always uh, or often tell audiences that uh, if you've got, you know got a flyer in the mail, you know you've never met me, maybe you've never been here before. It is very natural to come with your antennas up. And to say, I, want, I don't know what this guy is going to say, but whatever he says, I want to test it by the book, by the Bible, and see if it's right. And I encourage that. I definitely encourage that. I don't, I don't, I tell people, don't take my word for anything. I encourage you to hear me out, to listen, and then to check it out based on the Bible, and to get the little books, and then to read those books, and compare them with what you find here. And if it lines up with the book, then I would encourage you to hold on to it. Does that sound like a fair request? Okay, so what should we do at the beginning of a, of a Bible seminar? <clears throat> That's right, we should pray. And I'm a big believer in prayer. Uh, I pray every day. I pray most of the time, even before I get out of bed. In the morning, I just roll over on my knees, put my head on my pillow, and I'm praying. So I'm a big believer in prayer. 
And that's what we need to be doing, asking for God to bless us and to help us, to help me, to help you, and that this will be a very uh, positive and eye-opening and enlightening weekend. So let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for gathering us together on a Friday evening here in Wichita, Kansas. And Lord, thank you that we are all alive. Uh, we've come from many different walks of life. We've been through many ups and downs in our lives, no doubt, all of us. And we pray that you will be in the middle of these meetings. We pray uh, in the name of Jesus for the Spirit of God, for the Holy Spirit. To speak to our hearts, we live in momentous times, crisis times, incredible times, and we pray, Lord, that you will uh, be here and help us and help me that this will be uh, an event that pleases you and brings us closer to you and helps us to understand the Bible better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, America in Crisis. And this is part one, and the title, as you've seen in the flyer, is called The Rise of the Beast. So if you have your Bibles, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, this is what we read. The Bible says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw, and what did John see? He saw a beast right rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns very strange and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of what the name of blasphemy right this is a very uh, interesting and mysterious verse uh, most of you may know this maybe some of you don't but if I were to ask you a kind of a quiz question, my wife is a high school teacher. She often quizzes her, her students. So here's a quiz question. Uh, what is the, what is the all time best selling book in all of history that has been translated into more languages and uh, read and reread by more people throughout the world? It's the Bible. That's right. It's not Harry Potter. It's the Bible. So this is the world's best-selling book. And what is the world's uh, all-time best-selling, or maybe not best-selling, but most widely read book within the Bible that deals with the future and Bible prophecy? It's the book of Revelation, right, which is the last book of the Bible. Uh, of 66 books in the Bible, Revelation is the last one. And the book of Revelation deals with many strange things. It deals with creatures and, and a, a woman riding a beast and a seven-headed, ten-horned beast and something called the Mark of the Beast and a final battle called the Armageddon. And, and in these days, people are trying to figure these things out because they're looking around the world, they're looking at all the things that are happening uh, in this world, and they're trying to find out whether the world's all-time best-selling book and the most widely read book on prophecy, which is the book of Revelation, and whether it has anything to say about the times in which we live. And I believe it does. And it's just very uh, uh, in intriguing that when you open this book and you read it, it talks about this monster, this seven-headed, ten-horned creature that rises out of the ocean. Now, when my kids were little, I, I'm a, a parent. My son is 18 years, old, 18 years old, just finishing his first year of college. And my daughter is 15 year old, uh, uh, Abigail. And when my kids were little and my wife and I and the family, we would travel quite a bit. We would always look for a zoo. And I seem to remember, isn't there a zoo in Wichita? Am I correct? Yes, we went to the Wichita Zoo in my, uh, actually, how, how long ago? 30 years ago. So no, I didn't have kids at that time. But we've been to the San Diego Zoo, we've been to the Los Angeles Zoo, we've been to different zoos, and I've been to the Wichita Zoo. But all the zoos that me and my family have ever been to, we've seen lions and tigers and bears and cheetahs and giraffes, but we've never seen anything like this. Have you? They're, they're, uh, you won't find in the Wichita Zoo a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. And the reason why you won't find this in a zoo is because this uh, 
is not a literal creature that you're going to find somewhere on earth. This is what we call a symbol. It's a sacred symbol in the book of Revelation that Revelation often uses symbolic language to represent things. And it's up to us to try to decode and to try to figure out what do these symbols mean? And do these symbols have anything to do with us? So that's our, that's our challenge. And I believe that by the time we're done with this first meeting tonight, uh, you will be able to know who this beast is. That's my, that's my job. That's my, uh, my task is to try to explain who this beast is. Now, in order to figure this out, we have to look at what I call clues, just like in the, the fictitious Sherlock Holmes would look for the clues and then he would try to figure out who did it. It's the same with the book of Revelation and trying to figure out who is this beast. We have to look at the clues. And so if you look at chapter 13, and if you look at verse 5, and I'll put quite a few of these clues on the screen, and we'll try to figure this out. 13.5 says, there was given to him, to this beast, and what, what did he have? And what was he given? He was given a mouth. That's right. So keep that in mind, that whoever or whatever this is, uh, this beast has a big mouth. It was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies so whoever or whatever this is uh, the words that come out of its mouth are not good words now here's another another clue is found in verse 7. verse 7 says it was given to him to make war on what group of people on the saints right war on the saints and the saints are the people of god so we know that this beast is not uh, on the side of god he speaks against God, and he is at war with the people of God. That's another clue in verse 7. Now, if you keep reading, it tells us how much influence this beast is eventually going to have. It says that uh, it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given to him over how many people? It says over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall eventually worship this beast. This is quite a prediction. So whoever or whatever this is, we know he has a big mouth. We know he speaks blasphemous words. We know he makes war on the saints of God. And we know that eventually his influence is worldwide. Now, do you think just thinking about it uh, off the top of your head, that if the whole world is going to be following this beast, you think that the world knows and understands that the beast is the beast? Probably not. Uh, they don't, they, whoever this beast is, they, they don't think that the beast is a bad guy. They think he's a good guy and they follow him and he has influence all over the world. So that's, uh, that's an amazing point of the prophecy. Now, here's another very significant point. In verse 8, it says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written where? It says, In the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain from the foundation of the world. So that tells us that this beast is against the lamb and his followers. Now, when, we, when, when I mentioned that the, the beast itself is a symbol of something else, we have to try to figure out what that is. Uh, what about the lamb, the word lamb? Is this talking about a literal lamb? Does this mean that the, there's going to be a real seven-headed, ten-horned creature that's going to be uh, going after uh, a little four-legged animal? No, that's right. Uh, in the book of Revelation, when you keep reading it carefully, you discover that the word lamb is used many, many times as a symbol of who? Of Jesus, of, of God, right. Uh, Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said that in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29. 
Uh, there are many verses in the book of Revelation where Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. And this tells us something important, and that's this, that the book of Revelation is not just dealing with the bad guys, it's dealing with the good guys. It's not just talking about the beast, it's also talking about the Lamb. And the ultimate purpose, I believe, of Revelation is to show us who the bad guys are and to show us who the good guys are and to help us to be on the side of God and of Jesus on the side of good instead of being on the side of bad. And uh, this also shows us that Revelation itself is a battle between the two forces, between both. And it tells us that all that dwell upon the earth will eventually worship the beast whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, who don't they follow? They don't follow the beast. They don't want to follow the beast. They want to follow Jesus. They want to follow the Lamb. And their names are in his book. It tells us that the Lamb has a book. People who are on his side, who choose Jesus in this world, uh, their names get in his book. And one of these days, the whole world is going to follow the beast because their names aren't in the Lamb's book of life. And that sort of puts the, uh, the issues in front of us that we have the beast on the one side and we have the lamb on the other side. And I want you to know that my ultimate goal of coming to Wichita, the, the main reason why I'm here is to help you, to inspire you in your life to make a decision to be on the side of Jesus. That's really what it's all about. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. And as we get into the big issues that are coming, uh, that's going to be very, very clear that God wants us to be on the side of Jesus, not on the side ultimately of the devil. The devil is the force of evil behind the beast and behind everything that's bad in this world. And God wants us to be on the side of good, not on the side of bad. Does that make sense? Follow me so far? Are you with me? Okay, all right. So we're, and we're just getting started. Now let's go back to Revelation uh, 13 and let's look at verse 2. Here's another clue. And the more verses we put on the screen, the more we understand what Revelation 13 is about, then the issues become clearer. So in chapter 13, verse 2, it's very interesting. It says, and the beast which I saw was like what kind of an animal? Like a leopard, right? So there's a leopard. And his feet were like the feet of what kind of an animal? A bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of what? Of a lion, right? And then it says that the dragon gave to the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Now, I want you to really think closely about this because there's some details here that are very, very important. Um, the, the beast, or at least the beast out of the water that we're looking at tonight, uh, this beast is actually a combination creature. It's a, uh, it's, it's a combination of three other beasts. It has a mouth like a lion. It has a body like a leopard and it has feet like a bear. See that? Very interesting. You'll never find anything like this literally in this world. So we know this is definitely symbolic. So there's that creature up there. So it's a, it's a three-part combo beast. And then there's a fourth creature, which is called the dragon, that gives to this combo creature his power and his seat and great authority. See that? Now, most people have never really even thought about those details. People, most people don't read the Bible these days. In fact, it's sad that there are fewer and fewer people that are reading the Bible. Atheism is on the rise, secularism is on the rise, and all kinds of other different religions, uh, unbiblical religions. And so people are reading the Bible less and less. Uh, in, in, in my book, or the way I see it, as the world is getting uh, into increasingly difficult situations, we should be reading the Bible more. And as I look at the book of Revelation, I've concluded that there's two ways to read the book of Revelation. One way is, is what I call the, the way of the water skier. 
And the way of the water skier is to just skim the surface of the book, like water skiers do when they're, you know, being pulled by a boat out on the out on the uh, water, and they're just on the top. So that's the water skier way of of studying Revelation is just to skim the surface. And then the other way I call the way of the deep sea divers. Any deep sea divers here? Anybody? Uh, learn how to dive. Uh, I, I, I actually went, went one time diving with my son, Seth, when he was, oh, I think he was probably 14. We were on vacation and we were at some place and they offered us a dive. And so we got a little bit of training and we went down under the water, down about maybe about 30 feet down. He was scared to death to do it, but he wanted to do it, but he was scared. But uh, he finally did it. And when he got down under there and he could see the fish and he could see me and he went, this is great, dad. I'm really enjoying this. And so that was the closest thing we ever got to deep sea diving. But anyway, my point is that uh, I believe God wants us to go beyond just the surface of the book of Revelation. He wants us to go down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper so we can really understand what this book is about. And part of that deep sea diving uh, experience is by looking at the details of the beast, that the beast is not just the beast that's going to come at some point and the whole world's going to follow the beast. But the beast has, uh, has three different kinds of animals that are blended into this creature. And that is an important detail. He's like a lion. He's like a leopard. He's like a bear. And then there's the dragon who gives him his power. Are you with me? All right. Now, the reason why this is so important, and I'll, I, this will become clear as we go along, is uh, that there is one other book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that actually there's a book and there's a chapter that talks about a lion and a bear and a leopard and a dragon and 10 horns and a big mouth and the very things that are in Revelation 13 are also in this other chapter in the Old Testament. And I'm convinced that when we look at the details of chapter 13 and look at the details of that chapter in the Old Testament and put them together, then the issues will even become clearer. And it will help us to figure this out. Who is this strange creature? Okay, so a quiz question again. And there was actually one question I didn't ask you. I, I always, always ask. Uh, what's the world's all-time best-selling book? You answered that, the Bible. What's the world's uh, most widely read book on prophecy? You answered that, the book of Revelation. I didn't ask you this. Who is, who is the most famous human being in all of history that has had more books written about him than any other person who's ever lived? It's Jesus. That's right, by far, by far. And he's the center of the book uh, of the Bible and of the book of Revelation. And when we're dealing with the beast, we're dealing with his enemy. And so um, now another quick question was, what is the name of that book in the Old Testament that talks about these things? Okay, that's right. It's Daniel, the book of Daniel. Okay, now next question, a little bit harder. Uh, out of the 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, what is the, what is the single chapter that deals with the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, the ten horns, the mouth, all these strange things that are in Revelation 13. Anybody got it? That's right. Good. Good for you, boy. This is an astute audience. Very good. A++. It is Daniel 7. So let's turn in our Bibles or click, whichever you have, a book or your phone or some other device. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7. We're going to look at more creatures. Sometimes, you know, you want to get kids interested in the Bible and you tell little kids, say, did you know that the Bible talks about monsters? I go, really? I want to read my Bible. I want to read about the monsters. And that's what we read about in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel. 
Daniel talks about these strange creatures that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. So let's start with verse 1. Daniel 7 verse 1 says, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of what nation? King of Babylon, right? Now we live in America. Who's our president? President Biden. Years ago, there was another mighty nation before the days of America, and it was called Babylon, the mighty nation of Babylon. And the uh, king of Babylon, he wasn't the president, he was the king. His name was uh, Belshazzar. He was the last king of Babylon. Now remember this, that Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel, was living in the nation of Babylon. That's important to remember. And Daniel went to bed one night and he had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. And he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. So Daniel's describing what he saw in his dream. And in verse three, it says that four great, what? Four great beasts, right, came up from the sea, uh, diverse or different one from the other. So in the book of Revelation, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he saw a beast come out of the sea. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel went to bed and had a dream, and he saw four beasts come up out of the sea. And these four are described in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, in verse 4, the first one was like what kind of an animal? Like a lion. Bingo, we saw that in Revelation. And then in verse 5, behold, another beast, a second one, like a what? Like a bear. Bingo, we saw that in Revelation. And then verse 6, after this I beheld and lo, another like what kind of an animal? Like a leopard. Bingo, we read that in Revelation. Uh, this leopard had four wings and it also had four heads. And dominion was given to it. So we have this lion with eagle's wings. And then we have a bear with three ribs in its mouth. And then we have a leopard with four heads and four wings, very strange. And then we have a fourth creature that Daniel didn't really know exactly what to call it. I think it's safe, it was like a dragon. Verse seven says, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broken pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse or different from all the beasts that were before it. And how many horns did it have? It had 10 horns, right? So do you see the parallels between Revelation 13 and Daniel 7? Both chapters talk about a lion, a bear, a leopard, a dragon-like creature with 10 horns. Same thing. So we definitely have a connection. And I believe these two chapters are like a key fitting into a lock, and they provide clues that help us to understand what this is all about. So we have, again, these, uh, these creatures. Now, here's a really important question, and that is this. What does a beast symbolize in Bible prophecy? Just like the lamb is a symbol of Jesus, so a beast in the Bible is also a symbol of something else. And the uh, $10 million question when it comes to interpreting the book of Revelation correctly, if we go down deep as a deep sea diver and not just a water skier, is to ask the question, what do these beasts symbolize? What do they represent? in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel. We have to figure this out. Now, some time ago I was, uh, I was online and I saw a news article with a picture of this man. He was all tattooed from top to bottom, or at least most of the way. And, uh, and you can see him with this uh, name on his head, uh, the beast. And so this made, this made news. People thought, my, look at this man, you know, is he, does he think he's the beast of the, of the Bible? Uh, a lot of different views on, on what, the, what a beast represents. Is it somebody like this? Is, is this the beast? 
I don't know if you heard this or not, but when Barack Obama was president of the United States a, a number of years ago, he used to be driven around in a, in a big black limousine that had a nickname. Anybody remember the nickname of that car? It was the beast. That's right. And so some people thought Barack Obama must be the beast because he's being driven around in a car that is called the beast. Now, I don't buy that theory, but it just shows, you know, there's different views out there. Some people think the beast is a, a very large computer in Belgium. Have you ever heard that idea? That there's a massive computer, many stories high in Belgium that has the data of every single human being uh, on earth. Some people think that's where the beast is. It's a, the beast is a computer. Uh, but the reality is that that's just uh, not true. There is no gigantic computer in Belgium like that. It's all based on a novel that somebody wrote and somehow it got online and some, some people concluded that maybe that's the beast is the computer in the book of, or uh, in Belgium. So anyway, my point is that there's a lot of different interpretations of what beasts represent in prophecy. But here's the good news. The good news is that we don't have to guess what a beast is, because just like the Bible tells us that the lamb represents Jesus, so the Bible also tells us what a beast represents, it tells us very, very clearly. So I don't have to be like a magician pulling an interpretation out of a hat. I don't have to guess. I don't have to speculate. I don't have to stand before you or any other crowd and say, I think that a beast means this or a beast means that, because my opinion on that really wouldn't be worth much. The good news is the Bible tells us the world's all time best selling book tells us exactly what a beast means. And the answer to that is in verse 23. It's in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. What happens in this chapter is after Daniel had his dream, when he was in Babylon one night, uh, an angel of God came into his dream and began to explain to him what he had seen. And in verse 23, this is what it says. Verse 23 says, thus he said, and this is an angel talking to Daniel in his dream. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth computer upon the earth. Did I read that right? No. Okay, you're, I can see you're, you're, you're watching. That's good. I want, you, I want you to be on your toes. I want you to find out if I... If I'm not, if I start misquoting scripture and telling you things that aren't here, then don't come back. This will be your last meeting. You'll think, well, it was interesting, but I'm not going to come back because that guy's just a, a speculator from North Idaho. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to speculate. We have the answer right there very clearly. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth. And what is the word there? kingdom right let me see if my pointer works here hopefully this yes there we go kingdom the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth thus a beast is a kingdom so if the fourth beast which is this one is the fourth kingdom then the third beast would be the third what kingdom and the second beast would be the second kingdom and the first beast would be the first kingdom right and so this tells us if we stick to the scriptures that the beasts of daniel 7 which parallel revelation 13 uh, tells us that these beasts represent four kingdoms or nations that would rise and fall in the uh, during the course of history during the course of world events. Now, remember, uh, what nation was Daniel living in when he had this dream? He was in Babylon. Yeah, and that's where the dream starts. It starts in Babylon. And uh, if you go to a library and if you go to, if you actually, I, I think when I used to live here, 
I believe there used to be a Christian bookstore somewhere in Wichita. Is, it still, is there still one? Uh, it, you said it closed? Okay, all right, Mardell. So yeah, a lot of bookstores have closed because everybody's online, they're buying ebooks, uh, just like people are sending emails and the postal system is hurting because people don't send letters like they used to. Now they just send texts and emails and people aren't buying books like they used to buy. I still buy books. I love books. I actually read physical books. Um, where was I going to go with that? Uh, anyway, uh, if you were to go to a bookstore, a Christian bookstore, and if you go, if you were, were to go into the Bible commentary section and pick up some of the old commentaries of the past, 99% of them, if not all of them, will tell you that the, if you turn to Daniel 7 and see what do the four beasts of Daniel 7 mean, they will tell you that those four beasts represent the four nations of Babylon, which was followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, which was followed by the Greek Empire, ruled by Alexander the Great and then other Macedonian uh, rulers. And then that was followed by what mighty empire? It was Rome. That's right, the mighty Roman Empire with its Caesars like Nero and Tiberius and uh, Augustus, different Caesars. And so if you watch the History Channel, you can read about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. If you go to the library, you can read about Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. If you look at most Bible commentaries, if there's still a Christian bookstore around, you'll read in Daniel 7 that they interpret this, the majority, as Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, it's basic history, and the prophecy tells us that these represent kingdoms, mighty nations. Have you ever heard the phrase, the expression that, uh, or have you ever thought about where the word history comes from? History. History is a combination of two words. His story. His story. And really, history is God's story in world events. And in his word, he gives predictions about the rise and fall of mighty nations. And this is not uh, fiction, this is not fantasy. There's a lot of religious books that are out there that just deal with uh, speculation and fantasy and, and uh, mythology. But the Bible deals with, with reality. It deals with history. There was a mighty nation that was Babylon. And there was a mighty nation, Medo-Persia. And there was a mighty nation, Greece. And after Greece came Rome. And there's a lot of details in this prophecy I don't have time to go into today, but uh, one of this is very interesting, that one of the reasons I think why the, the third uh, beast is represented as a leopard is because leopards are very fast. And the, the man who conquered the world for Greece was Alexander the Great. And he never lost a battle. He conquered the world in eight years with his, uh, his army. He was very, very quick. And when he died in Babylon in, I uh, forgot the exact year it was, but he was approximately 33 years old. And his, his empire was then divided up among his four leading generals. So we have God symbolizing Greece as a leopard with four heads because Alexander was fast and when he died, his empire was divided among his four leading generals. So a lot of history behind uh, the books of Daniel and Revelation. The Bible is full of history. Are you following me so far? And this, this uh, background is essential in order for us to understand the book of Revelation when we get back to, back to the beast. Now let's, let's keep going. Verse 8, Daniel 7, verse 8. Remember the fourth beast representing Rome had how many horns? Ten horns, right. And then in verse 8, Daniel said, I considered the horns. I was thinking about these ten horns. And it says, and behold, there came up among them another what? 
little horn. Now, if there's 10 horns and then another one comes up, that one is number what? Number 11. So here's the 11th horn. And it says uh, the little, a little horn came up before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, this 11th horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a man. And what else did he have? He had a mouth. He had a big mouth. A mouth speaking great things. Now, it's hard to see this up here in this slide here, but here's uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire, the mighty dragon-like power of Rome. And here's the ten horns, and there's the eleventh horn. And if you can see closely, he has uh, eyes like a man, and he has a mouth speaking great things. Now, where have we read already tonight about something that had a big mouth? In Revelation. That's right. You're following me. We read about the beast. He had a mouth. So the, the, the beast from the water in Revelation 13, the combo beast, had a big mouth. And then the little horn of Daniel 7, he has a big mouth. Now, if you go down to verse 21, Daniel 7, 21, says, I beheld and the same horn, which is the 11th horn, he made, what did he do? He made war with the saints and he prevailed against them. So the little horn has a big mouth and he's making war on the people of God. And where did we read about that in the book of Revelation? Remember, those were some of the first clues I put on the screen. That's what the combination beast does, right? He does the same thing. So when we put the, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. I don't know how many of you like jigsaw puzzles. When I was a little kid, I used to love jigsaw puzzles. I put them together and try to figure them out and uh, a lot of people still do jigsaw puzzles today. And, and the prophecies of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 is like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like God's puzzle. Some people say this is also God's zoo. You've got his strange creatures, and we need to put the pieces together and try to figure this out. So we have a horn. The 11th horn has a mouth and makes war on the saints. And the beast has a mouth and makes war on the saints. And so what has happened is scholars have studied this. Most Bible commentaries recognize this, even though they may differ, on, differ on who the horn is or who the beast is, they still are pretty unanimous on the conclusion that whoever the horn is, it's the same as the beast because they both do the same things. It's just a different symbol. In Daniel 7, it's a horn. In Revelation 13, it's a beast. But they both do the same things, and they both represent whoever this, this is. That's what we have to find out. Now, uh, what we're going to do next is I'm going to list on the, on the screen here. I'm going to put them up there one by one. Uh, what I call eight Bible facts from Daniel 7. There's actually seven in Daniel 7 and one in Revelation 13. I'm going to put eight Bible facts about the horn and the beast. And I'm convinced, and I've been doing this for a long time, many, many years I've been doing this, giving these seminars. And I'm convinced that by the time I'm done putting up these eight Bible facts, when you look at all those clues right in front of you, you will be able to know exactly who the horn is and who the beast is that's, gonna, that's going to uh, lead the whole world astray. I believe you will be able to figure that out. That's my, my claim. And of course, you, you know, you'd be the judge if this makes sense to you. Now, I like to ask on my audiences at this point, uh, because... The conclusion, 
when, when I put those eight points on the on the screen, uh, I'm convinced that the conclusion is going to be somewhat shocking. Now, I've never had anybody have a heart attack in any of my meetings, so it's not that shocking. But it is going to be shocking, and it's also going to be controversial. I'll, I'll let that cat out of the bag just before we even get to that. So I'd like to ask the audience, and I'll ask you, how many of you are sure you want me to keep going and to put all those eight points on the screen? If you want me to keep going, let me see your hands. Okay, good. Look at that. Uh, and that always happens. And then I always tell people, you know what, I was going to keep going anyway, whether you raise your hand or not. Because <laughs> I didn't come all the way from Idaho to stop now. So it's just a little funny exercise. It's a lighter moment. And uh, my point, here's my point, that because you raised your hand, when I'm done with those eight points, and you see clearly who the horn is and who the beast is, uh, I don't want you to blame me. Okay, because you raised your hand, right? Don't blame me for what we find. Are we good on that? Don't blame me for what we find because I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write the book of Daniel. I didn't write the book of Revelation. I didn't create these clues. Who did? That's right, they came from God. I believe this is an inspired book. I believe it was God who gave Daniel the dream. And that it was God who showed John the book of Revelation and showed him those details about the beast. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, don't blame me. And I also believe that God has given us the, in, this information, not because he primarily wants to shock us or because he wants to hurt us. But I believe the Bible says that God is a God of love. God is love. That's why he sent Jesus into this world, is because he loves us, and he wants what's best for us. Uh, it's unfortunate that when God sent his best into the world, what did the world do to his best? Crucified him on a cross. That's right, because unfortunately, too many in the world don't really want the truth, because sometimes truth is painful to understand and to accept but for those of us that want the truth then god gives it to us and he gives it to us because he loves us and he wants what's best for us all right i believe that with all my heart that god is a good a good merciful god okay so let's go through these eight points uh, here we go point number one if you go back to verse seven we have this fourth beast, this dreadful and terrible beast. And who does that fourth beast represent again? It represents the Roman Empire. Remember that? The lion was Babylon. The bear was Medo-Persia. The leopard was Greece. And the fourth beast was the Roman Empire. Jesus was born during the time of the Roman Empire. Jesus was crucified by Roman soldiers. The early Christians spread out into the Roman world. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was beheaded by the Roman Emperor Nero. So Rome plays a major role in Bible prophecy. So the, that's the fourth beast and the, and the ten horns. The ten horn comes out of the head of the fourth beast. So in verse 8, when it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, Fact number one is what is, is the little horn comes up out of what empire? It comes up out of Rome. That's right. And I think I've got a point on that. Yes, we do. So there, so that's point number one, is that this little horn, this 11th horn, is a Roman horn. He's not an Australian horn. He's not a Russian horn. He's not an American horn. He's not a uh, Kiwi horn or a you know, horn from uh, New Zealand. He is a Roman horn. He's not a Chinese horn. So we got to focus on Rome because that's the fourth beast where the little horn comes up. 
So that's point number one. Point number two is in verse eight. It says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. When it says among them, what are the them? The them are the 10 horns, right? Because the fourth beast has 10 horns. And then among the 10 comes up the 11th horn. So that locates him. him. Now, let me give you a quick history lesson, lesson. Just like we have Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Eventually, the Roman Empire, Babylon eventually went down. Medo-Persia went down. Greece went down. And the mighty Roman Empire went down. And the reason why it went down was because it was invaded. It was invaded by different tribal groups that swept down from the northern parts of, uh, of Germany and different, different parts up here. This is a basic map of Europe. And 476 is the classic date for the fall of Rome. And there were, there were many different tribal groups, but there were 10 dominant ones. And they divided up the empire. Uh, and the Anglo-Saxons became what nation? They became England, the British, and the Franks became the French, the Alemanni became the Germans, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Visigoths became the, uh, the Spanish, the Vandals settled in North Africa, the Burgundians came down, uh, the Lombards became, came down into Italy, became the Italians, and there were the Ostrogoths. And these different tribal groups eventually settled into different parts of Europe, and they laid the foundation for the modern nations of Europe today. So if you go to Europe today and go to these different countries, this is where their, their origins, you go back to their origins, and there were 10 of them. And so when the Bible says that the, the little horn came up among the 10, that tells us that the little horn is going to be located somewhere in Western Europe. He's Roman. And he comes up among the 10 that divided up the Roman Empire. That is basic, uh, basic history. Now, here's another point. And I've got, we've got, uh, the first point is it comes up from the Roman Empire, fact number one. Number two, it rises among the 10 horns, pinpointing its place in Europe somewhere. And then the third point is it's, how big is this horn? It's little. That's right. It's very little. That's what the text says. There came up among them another little horn. So this 11th horn is small. It's interesting that he has, a, he's small, but what does he have about him that's, that's big? That's right, the mouth. That's right. He has a, he's a little horn with a big mouth. That's what prophecy is telling us. These are inspired prophetic details here. So that is uh, point number three. Now, point number four, if you go back to verse eight, it says that when the 11th one comes up, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So when the 11th horn comes up, he uproots how many of the first 10? Three. That's right. So if you have 10 and then three of them are uprooted, then how many you have left? Seven. And then you also have the, the next one, which is the, which would now be the eighth, the eighth horn. And so when it says he uproots them, that means there's nothing left of them. So that means if you go to Europe today, you'll find the remnants or portions of the seven, but not of the 10 because three of the 10 are uprooted and they're gone. I mean, if you, if there's a, if I were to go outside and find a tree, like there's a tree right there by that truck out that window. And if I were to uproot that tree, how much of that tree would be left? Nothing. And it's the same way with the 10 horns of Europe. Three of those 10 are going to be uprooted and they are going to be gone. So that's clue number four. Clue number five is it says, the text says, and behold, in this horn, there were eyes, like the eyes of a what? Of a man. Right, so that tells us that whatever this horn is, 
that it has eyes like the eyes of a man. So this horn has something to do with a man. Eyes like the eyes of a man. There's some kind of man leadership or eyes at the head of this horn. So that's another prophetic detail. And then the sixth point, which we've already read, is it has a mouth. It has a mouth speaking great things. So it's a little horn with eyes like a man with a big mouth that comes up among the ten. And then another point that we already read, number seven, is verse 21. We already read this. I beheld and the same horn, this eleventh horn, made war against, against what group of people? Against the saints. Right. And prevailed against them. So we already read that in Revelation as well. Revelation says the beast has a mouth speaking great things, and Revelation says the beast makes war with the saints. So here are seven, seven of the eight Bible facts about the little horn. That whoever this horn is, it's a persecuting horn. It's a horn that makes war on the people of God. Did you see that? It's right there in the Bible. Now, there's one more point, and that is back in Revelation. So let's go back to chapter 13 and look at verse 2. And this is where it's all the dots are going to be connected. And this is where you might need to get your smelling salts or your seat belts on, your spiritual seat belts. Because when we do a deep, not water skiing now, but when we do a deep dive into Revelation 13, verse 2, all the pieces are going to come together. And it's going to be very clear what we're talking about here. So let's go to verse, chapter 13, verse 2. Hold on to your seats. Now John said, and the beast which I saw, he was like to a leopard. And the reason why the beast is like a leopard, the combo beast, is because there's elements that go back to ancient Greece. And then it says he has feet like the feet of a what? Of a bear. And the reason for that is because there are things that are part of the beast that go back to ancient Persia. And then it says he has a mouth like the mouth of what kind of an animal? Like a lion, because there are parts of the beast that go back to ancient Babylon. So we have, we have the lion, now follow this. We have the lion representing Babylon, the bear representing Persia, the leopard representing Greece, and the dragon-like creature representing Rome. And it has 10 horns. And then we have a little horn that comes up that is the same as the combo beast in Revelation. And it has a body like a leopard, which goes back to Greece. It has feet like a bear, which goes back to Persia. It has a mouth like a lion, which goes back to Babylon. In other words, there's parts of Babylon and Persia and Greece that then get into Rome and then get into the little horn which is the same as the beast in Revelation 13. Are you following me? I know it takes close thinking, but that's what we find in the prophecy. And then it tells us that the, the dragon, which was the fourth beast, which represented the Roman Empire, and I, from my studies of Revelation, the primary dragon is the devil. But he's also... Uh, represented as the fourth beast because the devil used Rome to kill Jesus. And the devil used Rome to kill the early Christians. So that's why the symbols merge between the dragon and that fourth beast. So the dragon representing the Roman Empire, it says, would give to him, which is the combo beast, Three things, his power, he would give him his power, which is the power of the Roman Empire, goes into the beast. And his seat, the seat of the Roman Empire, is given to the beast. And great authority, the authority of the Roman Empire, is given to the beast. You see that? 
Now, notice specifically the word seat. When it says that the dragon or the Roman Empire would give to the beast his seat. Uh, every government that's ever existed in the history of humanity always has a seat of government somewhere. Who knows where is the seat of government of, uh, of, of Canada? It's in Ottawa, correct, that's right, Ottawa. Uh, where is the seat of government of, of Russia? It's in Moscow, that's right, Moscow. Uh, where is the seat of government of the United States of America? It's in Washington, D.C. And where was the seat of government of the mighty Roman Empire? It was in Rome. That's right, exactly. It was in uh, the city of Rome. And the scripture says that the seat of government of the Roman Empire would be given to the beast. In other words, just like the horn came out of the head of the Roman Empire, so the beast of Revelation 13 is going to sit upon the seat of government of the ancient Roman Empire. So that's our eighth clue, that the beast's seat of government is going to be inside of the city of Rome, right? Because the fourth beast gives his seat to the beast. The dragon gives his seat to the beast. Now, here is a summary of all eight points. Number one, about eight facts about the little horn, which is also the beast. Number one is it comes up from the Roman Empire, which means it's Roman. Number two, it rises among the ten horns that settled in Europe telling us that it's, a, it's somewhere in Europe. And number three, it's small. It's an 11th horn, little horn. Number four is it uproots three of the 10 in its rise. Number five, it has eyes like the eyes of a man. There's something to do with a man at the head of this horn. And number six, it has a, a mouth that speaks great things, great claims it makes for itself. Uh, number seven, it becomes a persecuting power that makes war against the saints. And number eight is its seat of government will be inside of the city of Rome. Are you following me? Yes, good. And I can see your heads nodding. And you know what happens? Every time I hold these seminars, and I've done these in Russia, I've done these in New Zealand, Canada, in America, in front of sometimes very large audiences. And when I get to this point and I, I tell my crowd, I say, most of you can probably tell where we're going with this. And what happens every single time I see heads nodding, just like I see them nodding now. I see your heads nodding. And the reason why your heads are nodding is because the, the, uh, when you look at the big picture, and connect all the dots, uh, it points only one direction. It becomes uh, extremely clear. The prophecy becomes very, very clear who this is talking about. And to me, that's the evidence of truth that I don't have to tell you, which I, I, I will shortly, but I don't have to tell you because you already know. Because when you put all the facts up right on the screen, very clear, when you have a knowledge of history and prophecy and you put the pieces together, uh, it's very, very clear who this is talking about. Uh, now, I've got a couple slides before I go to the application. A uh, couple, couple texts here that are very important about Jesus. Remember I mentioned that the book of Revelation is not just about the beast, but it's about the lamb. It's about Jesus. And there are two fundamental truths about Jesus in the New Testament that are crucial to understanding this topic. Uh, number one is 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, where Paul, who wrote the mo most of the New Testament, at least the majority of the books, uh, he said that there's one God in heaven and there is one mediator between God and men, 
And who is that one mediator? It's Jesus, that's right. It's the man, Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2.5. Now, my wife is a, a math teacher. She loves math. I actually prefer history. I'm not really crazy about math. It's never been my strong suit, but I love history. Uh, but anyway, even though I don't know math very well, or I'm not real good at math, I can understand this verse pretty clearly. That if I want to get to God, how many mediators do I have to go through? Only one. I don't have to go through many mediators, just one. And it's, it's Jesus. So that's uh, very clear. Now, another verse is in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, where somebody asked Paul, he said, what do I, what do I need to do to be saved? How can I get saved? I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. And Paul's answer is in that verse, Acts 16, 31, where Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, and you will be saved. So if I want to go to heaven, and if you want to go to heaven, which I'm assuming we all do, don't you want to go to heaven? Does it heaven sound better than, I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, Wichita's a great place, but it's not heaven. <laughs> not heaven. So if we want to get to heaven, the Bible's clear that we go through Jesus to get to God and that we believe in Jesus as our Savior. We don't get to heaven by our works. We don't get to heaven by being good enough. We get to heaven by believing in Jesus. Right? Is this biblical? Am I, am I so far on solid ground? Definitely. Now, here is a picture of, uh, guess who? That's me. When I was probably about 19 years old, at my dad's house, my stepmom found this picture. I'm flicking a lighter in front of a bar lamp. My eyes were probably bloodshot. I started smoking marijuana when I was 14 years old. I smoked pots for six years just about every day. I got into drugs, the wildlife, the Hollywood scene, uh, the concerts, uh, the big parties. I was on, the, on a road that was not a good road. I was destroying myself with drugs and a wild life. But when I was 20 years old, I picked up a Bible for the first time in my life. I'd never read the Bible before. And I picked it up and I began to read. And I read Ecclesiastes, Proverbs. I started reading the New Testament. I read about the life of Jesus. I read about his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, how he struggled with whether he was going to pay the debt, the big debt of the human race, including my debt to God because of my sins. And he finally made the choice that he was going to drink the cup. He was going to go all the way to the cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he was going to die for me, Steve Wahlberg, because I was a sinner. And he was going to take my place and suffer for my sins in my behalf so I don't have to suffer for them. And when I saw that, when I really saw that, and to me this is the biggest miracle that ever happened in my life, was when I saw that as I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and showed me that Jesus was my Savior. And I, what I did was I got on my knees. I'd never been on my knees before. I got on my knees in a dormitory room at the age of 20, and I prayed a prayer. I'd never prayed before, and I said something like, Dear God, I am a sinner. I know I'm a lost man. I've done so many bad things, and, but I, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, and I ask you to forgive me and to change my life. And I tell you, the Lord did a wonderful thing for me. Uh, Forty four years ago. What am I 64 now? 44 years ago, uh, Jesus came into my life and he changed me. And that's why I don't, I don't party anymore. I don't smoke pot anymore. I don't go to the discos or the concerts or the, the wild parties anymore. I have one wife, Kristen, 
I have two beautiful teenage children, Seth and Abby. I'm committed to Kristen. She's committed to me. I believe in living a moral life and doing what's right in the sight of God. And it's all because of Jesus. And I went straight to the Father through Jesus Christ. And that's what changed my life. Praise, praise God. Now, believe it or not, all this ties in with the beast. In the time that I have left, I'm going to go through this quickly. I'm going to, my next, I'm going to push the button and I'm going to show you who the beast is. So are you ready? Seatbelts on? Okay, all right, here we go. Nothing personal against anybody. I believe this is talking about a system, not about people. It's not about uh, people that may be part of this church that are good, honest, sincere people. It's talking about a system that fits biblical prophecy. Uh, and it's a fact that tonight, sitting upon the seat of the ancient Roman em uh, Empire, on its headquarters, is the uh, worldwide kingdom of the Roman Catholic Church, centered in the authority of the Pope, the world authority of, of the Pope. Now, take a look at this. Uh, the Pope, this is when Pope Francis became Pope, it says here uh, that he is the head of state. Pope Francis is the Pope of the Catholic Church, a title he holds, holds ex officio for being the Bishop of Rome, in which capacity he is also the absolute sovereign of the Vatican City State. So Pope Francis is not just a pastor. He's actually a sovereign ruler over his own country, over the Vatican City State. Now, here's something else very interesting. Guess what is the smallest state in the world? It is the Vatican, very tiny. Uh, it says here it's 0 0.02 square miles. The, it is the world's smallest state. The Vatican has a population of 770 people, which is uh, a lot less than Priest River, Idaho, where I live, which has about 1,700 people. Uh, and it says that uh, none of these are even per permanent residents. I, can have, I like to jog. I'm not much of a runner. I'm getting older. But I can run. I could run all around the Vatican if I wanted to. I could run around the entire country because it is so uh, it is so small. Now remember, prophecy tells us that we're dealing with a little tiny horn. Now here's a quick history lesson to see if the prophecy and the history if they fit. Uh, most important thing I want you to leave here tonight with more than anything else is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus died on the cross for Jews, for Muslims, for Hindus, for Buddhists, for atheists, for Christians, for Roman Catholics, for Protestants, for Republicans, for Democrats, for those who are vaccinated, those who are not vaccinated. Uh, Jesus died on the cross for everybody right for trump for desantis for hillary clinton for uh, whoever makes it to the presidency of the united states of america jesus died for everybody and i believe that he died for he died for the pope he died for us all and somehow he loves us all no matter who we are or no matter what we've done and the new testament's very clear there's only one mediator up there and it's jesus and that the way to get to heaven is through believing in him. Very, very clear. These are solid Bible facts. And what happened in history was when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his disciples were devastated. They thought he was the Messiah who was going to sit on the throne. And when he died on the cross, they thought it's over. We're done. Our master is crucified. But they forgot what he told them, that on the third day, he was going to rise from the dead. They forgot that little truth. But sure enough, on Sunday morning, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They saw him. They couldn't believe it. He was alive. He was real. And their whole life changed. Their whole world changed. That he was really the son of God, who was now alive again after he had actually died on a cross. And when Jesus went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit down on the disciples 
And he told them, go to all the world and preach and tell people who I am. Tell people what I did. Tell people that I love them and that I am the son of God. And that's what happened in the first century, the second century, the third century. The early Christians went out and they fanned out all over the Roman world and nobody could stop them. No matter how much opposition or persecution or beheadings or crucifixions or being eaten by the lions uh, in different uh, places for the entertainment of the Romans, the early Christians could not be stopped. If we, if we think we have it tough today, I tell you, we, have, we, don't, we don't know what it's like to go through real persecution like the early Christians uh, did. They were fiercely persecuted throughout the Roman Empire for a few hundred years, but they, they wouldn't stop. They kept on going and they spread out and they planted churches all over the empire, but the Romans persecuted them and killed them in droves. And here's an important point. I believe the reason why God allowed the barbarians to come into the Roman Empire, to invade it, and eventually to divide it up and bring it down, was because the Roman Empire had turned against his children. The Roman Empire crucified Christ and killed his followers. And here's a very important point. Whenever a nation turns against God and the Bible and Jesus and his people, its days are numbered. We must never forget that, that when a nation turns against Christianity and against Jesus, it's a very bad thing. And that's what happened to the Roman Empire. And finally, in the year 476, the Roman Empire collapsed. But prior to its collapse, churches were established all over the Roman Empire, including the city of Rome. So when Paul wrote when Paul, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome, and what was the name of that letter? Romans. So when you read the book of Romans in the New Testament, you're reading Paul's letter to the early Christian church that was founded in Rome. And that church was a good church. It was a spiritual church. It was a godly church. But what happened as time went on, that church became more powerful. And as the Roman Empire began to fall apart around it, that church somehow decided that it wanted more of the power of the disintegrating Roman Empire. So as the empire went down, the church became more powerful. And it said, we are gonna take the place of the Caesars. We are going to be uh, on top. And there were three of the different tribal groups that resisted the rise of the Roman church and they were uprooted one by one. The Vandals in North Africa were uprooted in 534 the Herali 493, and the Ostrogoths in Italy in 538. One by one, the three were uprooted. And this exactly fulfilled biblical prophecy. So point number one, uh, it did come out of Rome. Number two, it did rise in Europe. Number three, it did rise in the headquarters of the Roman Empire. Number four, it did uproot three of the 10 fulfilling prophecy. And what about point number, number five? Yes, it did. Uh, it grew and it eventually decided that one particular man was going to be at the head of this church. And he was given a title. He was given a name like no other leader of any church. He was called the Papa or the Pope, which means he's the head of all of the churches. And that fulfilled point number five, exactly as the prophecy said. And point number six said he would eventually have a mouth speaking great things. And what happened in history was that the Pope was given authority and he, he has made claims that he is the primary representative of Jesus Christ in this world. He's number one. He is the voice of God to humanity. He has supreme authority overall above churches, governments, kings, rulers, presidents. There is no human being on the planet that has more authority 
and then uh, Pope Francis. And during that time period, eventually the church said that all the churches of the world must submit to the Church of Rome, and if they don't, they cannot be saved. No Christian can be saved if he doesn't submit to the authority of the church. Now, what happened was, in the first few centuries, the early Christians were told, if you don't worship Caesar, we're going to kill you. And, there, and the early Christians said, we can't. We worship Jesus. We pray for the emperor, but we, can't, we're, we do not worship Caesar. And so they were killed. And then as the Roman Empire went down, and as the Roman Church came up, and instead of the Caesars, it was now the popes, what the pope said was, you need to do exactly what we say. And if you don't do what we say, you're going to die. And the early Christians, or during at that time, they just said, you know, we'll pray for you. Uh, we we want to love God and love others, but we cannot submit our minds to the authority of the Pope. We want to follow the Bible. We follow Jesus. There's only one mediator, and it's up there, and it's not you. And the way to be saved is believing in him, not in you. And so what happened as a result of that was point number uh, was it point number seven? Point number seven, the scripture says that the little horn would make war with the saints and prevail against them. And it's a sad fact of history that 50 to 100 million martyrs were put to death during the Dark Ages as a result of the Inquisition and persecution against the believers who were considered to be heretics simply because they believed there was only one mediator, they believed in Jesus, and they did not they could not submit their conscience to the authority of the church above the Bible. And these are all facts of history. And so it made war on them, just like prophecy predicted. Point number seven, the little horn would do it and the beast would do it. The last point is that the seat of government would be inside of the city of Rome. And that's where it is right now. So if you look at all the eight facts from Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, and if you look at history, they all fit, every single one of them. They fit perfectly right down the line. Now, I'm almost done here. Let me just, before we finish this up, I want to, I want to give you one more quick little window into a very important, pivotal moment in history, which was in the 1500s. What happened was uh, there was a German Catholic monk whose name was Johannes Tetzel. And he began to travel around Germany and he was raising money to build St. Peter's Church in Rome. And what he said was, here's a, here's a monk now, a, a German Catholic monk traveling around in Germany. And he told the Catholic citizens of Germany, he said, if you give money, to help rebuild the church in Rome, St. Peter's Church, uh, all your sins will be forgiven. We'll give you a certificate called a Certificate of Indulgences, which means you give the money and all your sins are forgiven. And so you can Google this, you can read about it. It's a very famous event in history. And what happened was at the same time, there was another German monk, Catholic monk, whose name was Martin Luther. And he was a professor at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. And his, uh, his parishioners started coming up to him with these certificates of indulgences that they got from Tetzel. And, and they came to Luther and said, Luther, we want you to pronounce that all of our sins are forgiven because we paid money to the church. And Luther was horrified. Luther was Catholic. And God has a lot of good Catholic people in this world. So I'm not against Catholic people, that's for sure. And Luther was Catholic at that time, and, but he was very conscientious and he had been reading his Bible and he read in the word of God that you can't buy salvation by paying money. You can't do it. You can only get salvation through believing in Jesus. And so the battle was on. And so Luther on October 31, 1517, a very famous date in history, Luther went to the castle church and he nailed 95 theses against indulgences 
showing that they're not biblical, that the Pope is wrong, the church is wrong, Tetzel's wrong, and you just can't buy salvation with money. And I tell you, those, uh, those 95 theses were translated and circulated throughout Europe, and they created quite a stir. And so four years later, on April 17, 1521, Luther was summoned and brought before a huge council, kind of like Congress, you know. Congress is going to vote one of these days on whether they should raise the debt ceiling or not and allow the government to borrow more money so that they can pay its bills. This is one of the big things happening in June. Well, there was a big event that happened in Germany when Luther was brought before the emperor. And all these nobles and princes and representatives of the Pope were all there. And uh, Luther was challenged and he was told to recant or repent from his teachings. And they had a stack of his books there and they said, Luther, are these books yours? And Luther said, yes, they're mine. And then the, the church said, are you going to give up your heretical ideas in saying that the church is wrong, that we can't collect money and forgive sins? And Luther had a, it was quite a moment, and all the eyes were on him. This is one of the most famous moments in history. Before Charles V, princes, Catholic leaders in Worms, Germany, as he defended himself. And finally, he made a speech. And this is what Luther said. Essentially, he said, I am going to follow my conscience. I am going to follow the Bible and the word of God more than, more than the teachings of men. And that salvation is only through the grace of Jesus, not by giving money to the church. And finally, he ended his speech with these words. He said, here I stand. I'm standing on the Bible. So help me God. Amen. Anybody else want to say amen? Amen. Yes, and those words have echoed down 500 years. Those words shook Europe and resulted in the mighty Protestant Reformation, which was designed to bring people back to the Bible and back to Jesus, back to Jesus Christ. And I believe that. Um, we've got two more slides and then we're done. We have a special final song here. Uh, coming down, down near our day, Here's an article from the National Catholic Reporter. This is a Catholic publication, which was called Church is Essential for Faith. There are no free agents, Pope says. Uh, June 25, 2014. Now notice what it says there. This is from Vatican City. It says Christians are not made in a laboratory, but in a community called the church, Pope Francis said. Pope Francis described as dangerous the temptation to believe that one can have a personal, direct, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ without communion with and the mediation of the church. So this is not me making this up. This is a statement from the Pope reported in a Catholic publication where the Pope basically says to his members that it is a dangerous thing for you to believe that you can go right to God through Jesus Christ rather than going through the mediation of the church. Now, let me ask you, after being here this whole night, is Pope Francis right or is he wrong? He's wrong, that's right. And if he got a flyer in the mail, and if he were to come to this seminar and to be sitting on the front, um, you know, I would respectfully, I would uh, let him know that God loves him, Jesus died for him, he paid the price for him, and that he can go to heaven, not through praying a lot of prayers to Mary, or praying to, uh, confessing to the priest, or, or doing anything other than believing in Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And that's the way he's going to get to heaven. And I probably would say, would you mind if I prayed for you? And I would pray for him, I would. In fact, if he invited me out to lunch, I'd go. Because I believe God loves this man and wants to save him just like he wants to save you and me. But the fact is, the reality is that he's wrong. 
And this is why the beast is the beast. It's because the beast leads away from simple faith in Jesus Christ. And that through having faith in him alone, that's how our names get in the book of life. And these are the issues of the book of Revelation. Tomorrow, we are going to get into the final issues, which I believe are right upon us. Uh, the most powerful religion in the world is in Bible prophecy. And tomorrow, we're going to look at whether the most powerful nation in the world is in Bible prophecy, which is the United States. Uh, part two tomorrow at four o'clock is will freedom vanish in America? And then we'll have a light supper. And then at seven o'clock, we'll have our final meeting when no man can buy or sell as we work our way through Revelation 13, looking at the first beast, at the second beast, at the mark of the beast, at world events, and what is coming in the future. Here's my last slide. Revelation 14, verse 4, tells us this. 14, 4, God says, These are the ones that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. God wants us to be like Luther and to be like the Christians of the past who are willing to do and to dare and to do anything for Jesus above all, because Jesus did everything for you and for me when he sacrificed himself on a cruel cross to pay the price for our sins.
Are we on? There we go. Whew, what a night. And we're just getting started. Uh, tonight, we identified the first beast. We'll give you a free book when you leave, all about it. You can study this on your own. We hope that you'll do that. And tomorrow, we'll get into the second beast from the earth, and then the time when our freedoms disappear, and what's on the other side of that, and how God is going to be with his people and bring us through no matter what comes. So uh, let's pray and ask God to help us. And thank you for being here tonight so much. Dear Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who died on the cross for the sins of the world, who paid the debt that we can't pay because we've all sinned. Thank you that you love us and you offer us full and free forgiveness and you offer us power, the Holy Spirit, to live for you in these difficult, challenging times of crisis. Please bring us back tomorrow to learn more. Please bless us as we go home and give us all a good night's sleep. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you for being here. God bless you. And we'll hope to see you tomorrow. You're welcome.